On April 10, 1912, crowds gathered at Southampton Beach to wave off what was, at the time, the world's largest and most prestigious ship, the RMS Titanic. The cost of the most expensive first-class parlor ticket was 4350 bucks. That's around $70,000 in today's money. But barely five days after steaming away, the ship was swallowed by the Atlantic Ocean. So let's rewind and go back to what actually happened on that fateful night. The captain wanted to set a speed record for the ship's maiden voyage and arrive early. The ship was deemed unsinkable, so he went full throttle into the dark Arctic waters. After spotting the 100-foot iceberg, the crew desperately tried to steer the vessel away and avoid the collision. But the Titanic was traveling too fast, and the iceberg tore down the side of the ship, creating a huge opening in the hull. It wasn't a continuous rip, and damage was caused in several places. In total, the damage spanned along an area of around 300 feet. But the ship's designers had prepared for the prospect of a collision and added watertight compartments down each side of the ship to act as a buffer zone. Four of these compartments could be breached, and the ship would still stay afloat. But because the iceberg tore down the side of the Titanic, it ripped holes in six compartments. The compartments didn't extend up the total height of all decks and weren't actually sealed at the top. This is why, when more than four were flooded, water reached over the top of the bulkheads and filled the remaining compartments, causing the ship to sink into the ocean. Think of it as water spilling over an ice cube tray. But what if the collision was head-on? Would it still have sunk? Ships are designed with potential crashes in mind, and most vessels have collision bulkheads in the bow. Most of all, it's like your car's bumper or crumple zone. It's a safety feature that can withstand a direct hit. The bow could have taken some of the impact, and some experts have suggested that if it hit head-on, only two to four of the watertight compartments would have been flooded. So, in theory, the Titanic might not have sunk and it might have even been able to continue sailing to its final destination at a much slower speed. The force of impact would likely have been huge, though. But although passengers would have been injured by the force, they'd have been able to stay on the ship to wait to be rescued by other ships, rather than being forced into the icy waters of the Atlantic. Still, one of the Titanic's designers, Edward Wilding, suggested that the force of the impact might not have actually been that big. He told the British Inquiry that lots of people scarcely felt the collision, and he believed the ship would not have sunk if it did hit the iceberg head-on. The ship was also designed with remotely operated watertight doors between all compartments, so any floods could have been quickly sorted out. Because Titanic had six breaches from the side collision, and because it happened so quickly, sealing the doors wouldn't have made a difference, as it was essentially impossible to save it by that point. The ship immediately began to flood, with water pouring in at a rate of roughly 7 tons per second, 15 times faster than it could be pumped out. So, while it sounds like the Titanic would have survived had the ship hit the iceberg head-on, this idea does come with some issues. First off, the collision bulkheads were designed to survive a crash with another ship, not a giant iceberg. If two ships collided, both would absorb some of the impact in their bulkheads sharing the impact and likely staying afloat. But an iceberg is stationary, meaning that Titanic would absorb most of the energy from the collision. If Titanic hit head first, because of the speed it was traveling, the impact would have likely traveled down the whole body of the ship. Just imagine a 46,000-ton ship traveling at around 20 knots. At some point, it hits an iceberg that weighs what could be over 100,000 tons. This collision would likely create a powerful force causing massive damage to the vessel. It is likely that seams would split, staircases would come tumbling down, and rivets would burst open across the ship. All that would have potentially flooded even more compartments. This could have caused Titanic to sink in a matter of minutes rather than hours. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. <clears throat> As we all know, the biggest part of it is hidden underwater. So if Titanic had been traveling head-on, it's likely it would have hit the part of the iceberg below the water first, which would send it veering off course. Hitting an iceberg is not like hitting a brick wall. In this case, the ice under the water would have torn open the bottom of the ship and caused damage to the sides. 
Icebergs also aren't flat, solid objects. If a flat collision happened, the ship might have stayed afloat, but icebergs come in many shapes and sizes, from domes to wedges. Studies have also been done on the steel used to produce Titanic, and the tests show the metal was about 10 times more brittle than the steel we use today. The ship was built before we understood the effects of low temperature on steel. The old steel used to make the vessel would not bend when faced with freezing temperatures, but break. Recovered pieces of Titanic's hull plates show that the hull just shattered on impact. Hitting head-on would also cause a very severe and abrupt stop. So even if the ship hadn't sunk, there would still have been major issues. Think about when you suddenly hit the brakes on your car, or when the bus stops while you're walking down the aisle and you get flung forward. Passengers would have been thrown across the ship, and because the crash happened at night, most people were sleeping, so wouldn't be able to effectively prepare for any sort of impact. This would result in injuries for most people on board. It would be especially bad for those at the front of the ship, where the accommodation for the off-duty firefighters, greasers, and engineers was. But while passengers and off-duty crew may have been thrown out of bed, there would be a lot more survivors than in the original scenario. A smaller ship might have been better suited for the trip. Titanic's size was certainly a challenge when it came to steering. In fact, it had just left her dock in Southampton when it nearly collided with another smaller ocean liner, the SS New York, missing it by just two feet. The gigantic steamship was obviously not made for maneuvering quickly in tight quarters. A ship that size required time and space to change course. But when it comes to ships versus icebergs, a ship's size doesn't always matter. The Islander was a steamship designed to travel the inside passage in Alaska. In the summer of 1901, it struck an iceberg, which tore a hole in the front portion or bow of the ship. The vessel did not sink right away, and the crew tried to steer it to safety. Ultimately, its bow completely submerged, and its stern was lifted up and out of the water. It didn't take much longer before the ship sank completely. Of the 168 passengers and crew members, 128 survived, and $3 million in gold was lost. Islander had a 240-foot hull, making it almost a quarter of the size of Titanic. And that smaller size didn't seem to be much help in preventing a collision with an iceberg. And then there was the Hans Hedtoff in 1959. Also known as the Little Titanic or the Danish Titanic, it was referred to as the safest ship afloat. It was 272 feet long, with 95 people on board. Much like the real Titanic, the Hans Hedtoff was specifically engineered to handle most of what the sea could throw its way. Along with its double steel bottom, it also had an armored bow and seven watertight compartments. How could such a ship sink? But it could, and it did. It was on its first voyage, returning to Copenhagen, when it ran into trouble. On January 30th, it hit an iceberg. An SOS was sent, but when the Johannes Cross arrived to help, the Hans Hedtoff was nowhere to be found. The only evidence of the ship's existence was a life belt that was washed ashore in Iceland nine months later. Again, the ship's smaller size didn't work in its favor. A smaller size of Titanic wouldn't have guaranteed a safe voyage in 1912. The final what-if concerns the last-minute choice when the iceberg was spotted and the alarm sounded. First, Titanic could attempt a complete stop. But this wasn't an option, as the ship needed a half a mile to come to a halt, and the iceberg was a mere 900 feet away. Second, the Titanic could attempt to avoid the iceberg by steering away from it. This is what the captain ordered, but the attempt was unsuccessful, resulting in a deep gash across the ship's hull. The final option? To hit the iceberg head-on. Would this have made any difference? The answer is an intriguing maybe. Some think a head-on collision would have saved Titanic. In this scenario, the collision would have limited the damage to the very front of the ship. Instead of the iceberg tearing through the hull and compromising several of the watertight compartments, only four of the compartments would have been breached. This meant the others could do their job of keeping Titanic afloat. The ship could be stuck, unable to move. 
but it would remain above water until help arrived. This would provide a ship like Carpathia enough time to reach the scene of the accident and bring the people on board to safety. One of the Titanic's designers, Edward Wilding, made a similar claim during an inquiry into the sinking. He argued that most people would have survived a head-on crash, and that Titanic itself would not have sunk. Others disagree, though. First, the special bulkheads on Titanic were designed specifically to protect the ship against collisions with other vessels, not with icebergs. These compartments would crumple upon impact, absorbing some of the force while the other ship absorbed the rest. Though the damage would still be extensive, the remaining bulkheads would keep the ship afloat. But an iceberg does not have the same flex in a collision as you would experience with another ship. Most of the force would be absorbed by Titanic, resulting in greater damage to the ship. Even worse, the impact would be carried through the full length of the ship. Rivets would burst, seams would tear, the compartments would quickly flood, and the ship would sink even faster, resulting in fewer survivors. In any case, as with most what-ifs, we'll never really know the answer. As tragic as Titanic's first and last voyage was, it did result in changes that helped make venturing out to sea much safer. Findings from hearings on the disaster led to the creation of the International Ice Patrol, or ICC, in 1914, an organization that tracks icebergs in the Atlantic and Arctic Oceans to ensure vessels in the area can avoid them. In the US and Britain, ships were obligated to carry enough lifeboats to accommodate every person aboard. Regular lifeboat drills were made mandatory. And finally, the bulkheads on ships were made higher to keep water out, and bottoms were stretched to create double hulls, helping make the compartments truly waterproof. There's no denying that Titanic was a terrible tragedy, but the lessons learned from that night to remember has helped prevent many more. April 10th, 1912. You're on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean in a small port town. Hundreds of people, and you among them, are going to board the huge, majestic ship. It's three times as long as the Statue of Liberty is tall. The ship is considered the most advanced and unsinkable watercraft of its time. You can see hundreds of luxury cabin windows on its deck, and the Titanic inscription on the magnificent iron hull. This day, the famous superliner set off on its first and last voyage from Southampton to New York. But now, you'll see an alternate story. You can hear a crew member announcing the start of the Titanic's trip. The ship sails from Africa to Bermuda, and the cause of its catastrophe will not be an iceberg at all. For four days, Titanic sails through North Atlantic waters. The sun warms the ship so much that during the day, all the passengers sit inside the ship. In the evening, when a cool breeze descends on the ocean, all the people go up on deck to watch the beautiful red sunset. Midnight, April 15th. You're sitting in your cabin reading a book. You're usually asleep at this time, but right now, you're just flipping through page after page. You close the book and look around the cabin. You feel like someone's watching you. You get up and break out into a cold sweat. An inexplicable feeling of anxiety permeates your body and causes goosebumps. You look out the cabin window where the ocean spray is banging the glass, but you can't see anything. There's a thick fog outside. You leave the cabin. In addition to you, several passengers also left their beds because of a heightened sense of danger. They greet you and ask what's wrong, but no one knows. You head to the stairs to go out on the deck to see the situation. At this point, the floor goes out from under your feet. A strong push makes you fall. A rumble reverberates through the Titanic. You get up and see more and more people going out from their cabins. You run up the stairs and meet a crew member. He doesn't tell you anything, but his eyes are wide with fear. You go up on deck and can hardly see anything. A thick, wet fog has settled over the ship. Several passengers are holding their heads as if they have a headache. You see the captain and ask him what happened. The captain admits that he has no idea where you are. You see a compass in his hand. The arrow turns in different directions. It's impossible to determine where exactly the ship is now. Interestingly, there was no such thing as the Bermuda Triangle before 1964. 
but the first reports of missing ships in this area date back to the middle of the 19th century. Another push. This time you've managed to stay on your feet. It felt like something big just hit the ship. You run to the railing at the edge of the deck and stare overboard. Through the white fog, you notice a huge shark fin. You haven't seen the full size of the shark, but from what you've seen, it must be as long as a train car. The shark swims away, but after a few seconds, you can see its fin again. It quickly approaches the ship and grabs the iron hull with its huge jaws. The deck is shaking. You can hear the grinding of metal. It seems this huge predator just made a hole in the hull. Only one creature on the planet can do this, the Megalodon. It's an ancient marine predator that measured almost 60 feet in length. Megalodon had no competition in the ocean. It was at the top of the food chain. It's believed the shark disappeared millions of years ago, but the ocean is only 5% explored. Here, it's alive and swimming in the mysterious waters of the Bermuda Triangle. Everyone aboard the ship is panicking. People from the lower decks are running upstairs. The Titanic slowly sinks and tilts to the side. Everyone goes to the lifeboats, but no one dares to get in them while the huge ancient monster is around. The ship's bow submerges under the water. You stand on the left side of the deck and see the Megalodon bite off pieces of the iron hull. You shout to the people in the stern section that the Megalodon is busy and they have time to evacuate. The first rescue boats with passengers go down on the water. Some passengers just jump overboard. Fortunately, the water is much warmer than the place where the Titanic actually sank. You put on a life jacket and jump too. The Megalodon attacks the ship and drags it deeper into the water. The smell of the Titanic's kitchen must have attracted it. You find yourself among the ship's flotsam and lifeboats. The fog's finally rising. The starry sky and the moon illuminate the sea's surface. People help you to climb on board a rescue boat. Everyone tries to sail as far away from the sinking ship as possible. You see the huge shark swimming around the Titanic. At this moment, something distracts it, and the predator goes away. More than half of the ship is already under the surface. The second part looks like a candle sticking out of the water. The ocean is calm. The sky's clear and cloudless. There's no wind. From the side, you see a huge wave growing behind the Titanic. It's about 50 feet high, like a five-story building. It knocks the ship down as easily as if it was made of paper. The monster wave dissolves in the water as quickly and unexpectedly as it appeared. You've just witnessed a rogue wave. This phenomenon occurs all over the world. Enormous waves suddenly appear, demolish ships, and disappear without a trace. Scientists still can't determine their exact nature, but according to the most popular theory, these waves are formed by kinetic vampirism. Under certain natural conditions, waves accumulate and exchange kinetic energy. Among all the waves out there, there is one vampire wave that absorbs the energy of all the others. When a lot of energy is accumulated, a huge wave grows and splashes it all out. Some believe the frequent disappearance of ships in the Bermuda Triangle occurred because of rogue waves. The people on the boats calm down. Someone sends a flare into the sky. You look at the ocean and see the triangular fin of the Megalodon emerging from the water. It's the size of a sailboat, and it's coming your way! You row the oars as fast as you can. People are screaming and calling for help. There's no chance of escape. The legendary monster is getting closer and closer. The shark's head peeks out from under the surface. It opens its huge maw filled with hundreds of sharp teeth. Each of them is the size of your palm. The boat would fit entirely inside the shark's mouth. It can swallow you whole. The shark stops and closes its mouth at arm's length from the boat. You can see the water bubbling around you. From the ocean depths, several giant tentacles lash out and wrap around the megalodon. They pull the shark down. You look over the side and see a purple glow with a black circle in the center. Someone on the boat notices it too. People start screaming, it's looking at us, a woman shouts. After a second, you get goosebumps and a shiver runs through your entire body. This purple glow is something's eye, and the black circle is the pupil. The creature that is looking at you right now is so big that the boat seems like a grain of rice to it. It's the Kraken. 
the giant squid, an ancient monster that sank hundreds of ships, but whose existence has not been proven by anyone yet. Fortunately, the boat you're sitting in is too small to interest the kraken. You can see its eye moving deeper away. Huge tentacles pull the struggling megalodon into the depths. An hour passes, and another big superliner arrives at the wreck of the Titanic. All the passengers are rescued. You look back at the calm sea, at the place where the Titanic recently sailed. You climb aboard the rescue ship and promise yourself never to go on a sea voyage again. That's it for today. So hey, if you pacified your curiosity, then give the video a like and share it with your friends. Or if you want more, just click on these videos and stay on the bright side.